For those who watch us from the outside, ESPOL is the European School of Political and Social Sciences at the Catholic University Lille in France. Um, for more information on the Research Center and on our school, please have a look at our website. Now, coming to today's conference, we are very happy to welcome Joost de Moor, who will give a presentation titled Demand Action or Do It Yourself, Climate Justice Movements and the Changing Role of the State. But before that, I would like to uh, introduce our speaker. Um, Joost de Moor is a postdoctoral researcher at the Department of Political Science at Stockholm University, where, is, where he is conducting um, a research project on why social movements do or do not become engaged with climate change adaptation. His main research interests are in environmental and climate politics, and social movements, political consumerism and lifestyle politics. Joost has a background in anthropology and in political science, and uh, he combines qualitative and quantitative methods uh, in his research. He is particularly interested in uh, environmental and urban movements and in citizens' engagement in protest, uh, prefigurative politics and lifestyle politics. Before coming to Stockholm University, Joost worked at Kiel University and at the Center for the Understanding of Sustainable Prosperity, CEUSP, uh, both in the UK, and he obtained his uh, PhD from the University of Antwerp in Belgium. So in his presentation today, Joost uh, addresses the climate justice movement, so a very um, a timely topic, um, of course, um, of, of great interest to to all of us. Now, before I give the word to Joost, I would also like you like to introduce you to my colleague Brendan Kohlsaid, who is uh, Associate Professor at ASPOL. So Brendan and myself, we will both um, discuss uh, the presentation of Joost um, and ask uh, questions coming in um, uh, from you, from you, from the participants via the uh, Zoom chat function, which will then hopefully result in an interesting conversation. Now, I would like to give the floor to Joost. Uh, very happy to have you here. Uh, we are looking very much forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Sabine, for the introduction. Um, and thank you also very much for uh, providing me this opportunity uh, to speak here to you at ESPO, um, to everyone present. Thank you for being here uh, to listen. Um, I think I've successfully shared my screen with you now. Um, so I'll be showing some uh, slides. Please let me know if you don't see them, but I assume that you do. Um, good. Right. Um, so the presentation that I uh, will be giving today has, as Sabine already said, the title Demand Action or Do It Yourself, Climate Justice Movements and the Changing Role um, of the State. And I'll be talking about something that's related to climate change. And climate change is something that, um, as many of you know, is a very urgent uh, problem, a problem that has been receiving more and more attention uh, in recent years. Um, but it is very far from a new problem, or better said, we have known for a very, very long time that it is a problem. In fact, as early as 1859, some people were already thinking or theorizing that the emission of CO2 uh, as a result of burning fossil fuels would have some effect similar to um, climate change. So we've known about that for a very long time. We haven't been very good at doing something about it though. And as a result, we've also for quite a long time have had people uh, protesting to, to demand that governments uh, do more about this problem. The picture you see here is uh, a climate march uh, in 2009 at the COP15 uh, climate summit, but actually climate protest already goes back a bit further in history, back into the 90s and around 2000 or so. Um, we saw the first, uh, I think what we can call mass mobilizations around uh, climate. So we've already seen climate demonstrations, climate movements for about two, three decades. 
Um, and as you all know, I'm sure, um, we've in recent years, especially since the end of 2018, seen sort of an, a new surge in, uh, in climate mobilizations, especially under impulse of Fridays for Future and Extinction Rebellion. This picture here I found uh, online is actually a picture of a Fridays for Future demonstration um, in Lille. Perhaps some of you were present at this demonstration. But the fact that we've already known so long about climate change and that people have been protesting to demand stricter climate action for so long, of course, makes one, one wonder whether these recent protests are anything new, um, are they different from previous protests? And more importantly, can we expect that they will solve the problem if previous efforts to do so have not solved the problem? Um, is there anything new and can we expect something from these new climate demonstrations? Or is it, um, in the words of, uh, of Albert Einstein, um, madness to, do, to keep doing the same thing and expect something different to come out of it? So those are kind of questions that I will be speaking to um, in today's lecture. And I will, of course, argue that there is something specific about the recent climate mobilizations when we look to at trends of climate activism in recent decades. To give you a sense of how climate activism, which from the outside might look quite similar, can in fact be very different um, from the inside, if you want, let's look at these two uh, pictures. Um, to the untrained eye, um, these two uh, situations might look quite similar. Um, in both cases, we see climate activists uh, blocking a certain site with their bodies sitting together side by side um, out of concern for climate and in protest against the fact that we are not addressing this problem sufficiently. But when we look closer, the logic of both these action forms is actually very, very different. So on the left, of course, here, we see uh, an Extinction Rebellion protest. Uh, Extinction Rebellion has been, like Fridays for Future, active in climate politics since about late 2018. On the right, we see um, a coal mine occupation by the German Ende Gelände network, um, which has been organizing these kinds of mass direct actions since, um, since about 2015, I believe. So they're a bit older. So when we look at why these people are doing this, why these people are blocking these spaces um, they are occupying, um, let's look first at what Extinction Rebellion is doing. First of all, we see that they demand something. They demand something from governments. They demand that governments tell the truth about the ecological crisis. They demand from governments that they make sure that we go to zero emissions by 2025. And they demand from government that they organize a participatory democracy, in principle, giving rights to citizens to get to be more participating in decision making, in particular uh, around how uh, climate, the climate crisis can be addressed. This is very different from how those people involved in Ende Gelände are um, explaining or motivating what they are doing. So one of their occupations in 2016, they explain as follows. Pentecost 2016, Ende Gelände went to Lusatia with nearly 4,000 people to block lignite mining infrastructure and show that we are the investment risk. So they didn't go there to demand anything from governments. They went there to directly block the mining process and in particular to present an investment risk, the idea being that um, protecting mines against, the, against these kinds of direct action is very costly. Um, the investment in security personnel, in security infrastructure are very high. And so what these activists think they are doing is um, increasing the cost of this mining, pushing mining for fossil fuels over the edge of, uh, of uh, profitability, thereby uh, having a direct impact on the ability of, of mining to continue in this way. So again, Extinction Rebellion was raising their voice towards governments to demand action. And the Gelände was basically exiting from the, the, the strict, uh, strictly speaking, democratic uh, process and taking matters into their own hands. 
We can make similar analysis of these two um, pictures. I already introduced the picture on the left, uh, March around the COP15 Copenhagen 2009 climate summit. On the right, we see a dem similar demonstration around the COP21 um, summit in uh, Paris in 2015. Um, whereas the people on the picture in the left are still raising a clear voice, they are still making clear demands uh, to the, the, the world leaders that were gathered in Copenhagen um, to try and come up with a replacement of the then still active um, Kyoto Protocol. Um, the people on the right um, are actually part of a mobilization that explicitly said that it was not about trying to influence the, the climate talks because they said the climate talks will never be able to, to give us any meaningful output with regards to climate, uh, resolving the climate crisis. So we take this platform, this stage, to organize a, a climate movement that will take matters into its own hands. So again, we see here something more of an exit from the political system. Other examples of something that could look like an exit, people taking matters into their own hands through uh, local organic farming, people who are raising their voice in Fridays for Future protests, and again, Extinction Rebellion, which we might say is also again raising more their voice to demand action from government. So quite distinct logics in seemingly or visually similar climate activism. So this raises some important questions, and in particular it raises questions with regards to um, the role of the state and of the role of citizens in addressing climate change. So it raises questions such as what does the shifting role of the state in climate activism look like? We've already, of course, seen a bit of that in this introduction. How can we explain that shifting role? How can we explain that one group of activists um, tries to make demands from uh, the state, whereas the other group of activists rather decides to basically act, act as if the state doesn't exist. What can that tell us about the meaning and the significance of the climate movement today? And finally, what may it reveal about the green state in the Anthropocene? Uh, the Anthropocene, of course, being the, uh, the epoch we are uh, arguably living in now, in which human action on the planet has gotten such a big impact that we can start thinking of it as a geological force. So these are some questions that I try to address in this lecture. I won't be able to address all of them extensively, but keep this in the back of your mind. Um, I had these questions in the back of my mind when I was um, drawing up this lecture. So what I will be doing in the remainder um, of this lecture um, is address the following three um, points. And these are basically chronological, you can think of them as chronological. Um, I will first discuss how we went beyond the traditional model of environmental action, which was traditionally focused by and large on trying to influence uh, government decisions. I will then discuss what kinds of new arenas of environmental action emerged um, as a result of that. And I will also critically uh, introduce some critical uh, debates um, as to whether or not that's a good idea, these new arena, uh, exploring these new arenas for environmental action. And I will finally come back to the question of the most recent waves of uh, environmental action or climate action um, with Fridays uh, for Future and Extinction Rebellion kind of reclaiming the state. So jumping into the first bit, um, when I talk about the traditional model of environmental action, it's of course a bit of a simplification. But the idea is that it was primarily uh, organized um, around trying to put pressure on, on states and later, uh, in particular in the case of climate change, on the UN uh, to make demands to put pressure on these governments um, and to get basically uh, these governments to address the problem of climate change, but also some other ecological problems such as biodiversity loss, of course. And we see over time that there is some increasing recognition of movements within these spheres. The environmental movement has been successful to some extent in putting the environment on political agendas 
and the same can be said for climate um, in particular. Over time, one could say that we see a growing willingness of states in response to these movements to act on issues like climate change. But unfortunately, this has not really led to a clear um, delivery of change, or at least not the kind of change that any scientist, any climate scientist would argue is uh, by, by any means sufficient given the size of the problem. We can of course have a discussion about why that is the change, uh, where, why that is the case. It might have something to do with the fact that climate change itself is a wicked problem. It might have something to do with uh, more general theories of, of collective action problems. It might have something to do, depending on your analysis, with the fact that the state can be seen as a growth machine that supports um, capitalist expansion of, of the economy. Whatever the case, it is quite clear that the state has so far failed to deliver um, on its self-acclaimed willingness to do something about this problem. And we see this um, reflected as well um, at the international level when in the United Nations Framework Convention for Climate Change um, states come together in climate summits to try and provide a global answer to the climate problem. So already in 2013, Thomas Hill wrote, for instance, that global problems like climate change call for incre increased collective and cooperative action, but multilateralism's ability to achieve this has eroded relative to the challenges it faces. And climate activists know about this. According to Jennifer Hedden, writing in 2015, the idea that the UNFCCC will not produce an acceptable climate agreement now seems to be fa a fairly mainstream view. A few years earlier, this had been the opinion of the more radical wing of the climate movement. By 2015, uh, this seemed to be something that a very large, um, including the mainstream parts of the climate movement, agreed upon. As a result, of course, it becomes a bit questionable whether activism should still try and influence states or international governmental organizations like the UN. Um, states' inability to address um, main environmental issues as a result starts driving what uh, Ulrich Beck in his work on the risk society has called sub-politics. So sub-politics being away from what we typically think of as politics as parliamentary arenas, governments, etc., taking politics to new arenas like, for instance, uh, the market, uh, private lives, etc., reflected in things like direct action against coal mines um, or DIY actions in our everyday life where we take responsibility through the politicization of our lifestyles, for instance, people becoming vegetarian uh, to reduce their carbon footprint or, or stopping flying, etc. So we can understand the emergence of this kind of DIY activism as a response to the, the ongoing um, seeming inability of states and international organizations to address problems like climate change. Keep in mind though that this is, should be seen more as a partial strategic reorientation than a definitive exit. Over the years we've continuously seen that both individuals and organizations tend to combine all strategies in all kinds of ways, and we can talk about that uh, later. So when we, when we talk about the emergence of direct action and DIY activism, we shouldn't think of it as a, a sort of a strong end to more state-oriented activism, rather as a subtle shift. So let's look a bit closer then, secondly, at what these new arenas for environmental action um, kind of contain and what kind of challenges emerge when activists start acting in this way. On this slide, you see a number of pictures that um, one could define as lifestyle politics. These are all kinds of ways of do-it-yourself politics, uh, primarily placed in the arena of everyday life and the market, where people take responsibility in their own hands to address environmental problems. Um, so we see community energy, we see a community, community support of agriculture, we see an image representing uh, vegetarianism, um, we see an image representing people uh, renovating their house to make it more energy efficient, people driving their bikes to work instead of their cars, um, ethical uh, 
food shopping, ethical clothing shopping, um, simple, more simplification of lifestyles, etc. All these kinds of ways that we've become familiar with as ways in which in our everyday lives we can take responsibility for addressing environmental um, problems. Of course, these action forms are not new. Um, actually, since the emergence of the environmental movement in the late 1960s and 1970s, people have already started to try and develop alternative, more ecologically friendly ways um, of living. But it is seen as something that has been growing as one of these exit DIY responses to the weakness of the state to address environmental problems. So in one case study um, that I did in Belgium, um, an activist, for instance, explained to me why she was so involved um, in a local uh, food production, uh, alternative food production organization. Uh, she explained, I wouldn't go as far as to say that engaging in state-oriented politics is useless, but party politics are uh, Party politics are open to our concerns, but I don't believe in the system's ability to act. Instead, I think we can better do it ourselves. A similar um, example um, showing that everyday life uh, politics are seen as a kind of DIY solution to the inability of the state to act is this book review that I found online of the, of the book, The Power of Just Doing Stuff by Rob Hopkins. Rob Hopkins is the founder um, of the transition towns uh, movement. And here, this book is kind of a, a guide to, to how you be can, can become a transition towns activist. Transition towns is, the, is a network of people um, who try and do this kind of DIY politics at a local scale. So Megan kind of liked the book, uh, giving it a four-star review. Um, and she explained that uh, for me, the transi transition town movement is one of the best things going right now. Taking a realistic look at peak oil, climate change, and our long-term economic problems, and then finding ways for citizens to take collective action to address all these, all of these together. The message is: think about the world, and you, you want to see one in which these long-term dilemmas are actually addressed. And rather than wait for government officials or someone else to make it happen, make it happen yourself with your family, friends, and neighbors. So this really captures this idea of we can no longer wait for governments to act. If we wait for governments to act, it will be too late. Instead, we need to act ourselves right now and take matters into our own hand through DIY politics. So that sounds like a very timely response um, to the situation that we find ourselves in. But it is an approach that is actually not free from critique. Some have actually defined this kind of response to climate change as the depoliticization of climate activism, as taking out sort of the, the, the sting out of activism and pacifying it into something that is no longer able to challenge the system that is driving uh, all these forms of ecological destruction. So Jensen argued in 2009 that consumer culture and capital, the capitalist mindset have taught us to substitute acts of political con uh, personal consumption for organized political resistance. A friend of mine, uh, also a climate activist, um, wrote on, on Facebook, I saw him write this response. Um, he, uh, he replied to a guy called Peter, who basically made this argument like, no, we, we, it is time we take responsibility for this problem ourselves and our lifestyles. So this uh, person responded, thank you for commenting, Peter. You raised some important issues, but I beg to differ. Abolitionists were, weren't self-absorbed, beautiful souls consuming slave-free cotton or chocolate. They were abolitionists because they wanted to change the system, not their shirts. Your consumer guilt argument falls short simply because individual purity has never achieved anything other than distraction. And that's, of course, a very, very harsh critique of this kind of DIY activism, basically saying it is a distraction. It is only there for you to feel good about it. Um, so, in here we see two main concerns. First, everyday life environmentalism, DIY environmentalism, does not confront the status quo like organized resistance does, or at least that's what the critics say. Instead, it aims to gradually replace the status quo. So, it tries to develop alternatives, hoping that one day those alternatives will become the mainstream, thereby resolving the problem. 
but many critics worry lifestyle politics are too small scale. They are typically unable to, to reach beyond usual suspects, the people who are already convinced about this, the, the societal minority that is readily willing to change their um, lifestyles, it is very difficult to reach beyond those usual suspects. And even among those usual suspects, we typically find huge value action gaps. We find that these people, even though they are motivated to uh, obtain ecologically responsible lifestyles, that actually the gap between their values and their motivations and what they actually do in an everyday life is huge. Even the most motivated ecological citizens uh, today generally do not have a lifestyle that fits within the, bound the boundaries of our planet. So as Bluedorn has argued about this kind of activism, remaining purely experimental and experiential, they are neither really designed to unhinge the logic which they appear to be challenging, nor are they ever likely to achieve this. Now, I think that um, there is some truth to these criticisms. I think that we do need to be very critical about any form of activism. We always need to reflect very critically about whether or not it is in any way likely to result in the change we want to see. But I think that these criticisms, even though they have some, some core truth to them, are a bit too harsh. And I think they miss a few points. First of all, we do see that everyday environmentalism is spreading and scaling up. Um, we see that more and more people get involved in it. We see more and more product lines being uh, organized following their principles. But of course, still, there's a huge gap between what needs to happen and what is happening. And it's questionable whether in time that gap will be bridged. Importantly, we found in a lot of our research um, that a lot of activists are very much aware of these challenges and that they actually actively try to deal with them. For instance, by developing synergies with resistance tactics. So to give you um, some examples of groups in the UK um, that are primarily involved with developing these kinds of everyday life forms of activism, these kinds of DIY activism, but they often use this to provide also a platform to organize more protest-oriented kinds of activism, for instance, to oppose fracking in the UK. So activists are, are aware of the limits of focusing on DIY politics, and they are actually limit, link it to, to more protest-oriented politics. Um, and finally, following that same logic, and, uh, and for everyday environmentalism does not actually necessarily replace uh, resistance. Um, in a lot of the research that I've been involved in, we actually found that people who are involved in, say, lifestyle politics over time become more likely to be also involved in other forms of activism and groups, as I said, uh, organizations that are involved in organizing uh, lifestyle politics are often also involved in organizing, uh, for instance, political protests. And there's often synergetic relations between those two, even though those are actually not automatic. It, it takes work and it's not always happening. There is one more problem to mention with this DIY um, politics approach. And that has something to do with the, the global nature of the climate problem. Um, what we saw when activists basically moved away from organizing once a year at every climate summit, having this global mobilization where activists from all around the world come together in, a, in an orchestrated action to demand uh, that government takes action on climate change, we see that more and more groups go back to where they, where they came from, to local actions, and they feel that this is a more useful way to spend their time, but they run into the problem that these kinds of local forms of action are um, somewhat disconnected, that they don't add up to a, a sort of this global response that the global problem of climate change um, requires. Um, so DIY politics tend to be quite fragmented. And one of the challenges, therefore, that the climate movement currently faces is that if they want to focus more on, on local DIY politics, then they need to find a strategy to, 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 to organize this into a global challenge to a global problem. And they haven't really found this, to my knowledge. So it's another problem to keep in mind here. Some colleagues of mine um, have recently suggested 
that um, the, the icon of Greta Thunberg might actually um, resolve this problem. That it seems that Fridays for Future in the, in the figure of uh, Greta Thunberg has found um, a way to organize at a global level without really going to those climate summits um, and linking up local forms of action around this, this global icon. Um, I think it remains to be seen whether it is in the long term the case, but I think it's an, an interesting idea. So to sum up what I've been saying so far, uh, we've seen the emergence of everyday activism and DIY active, um, activism as a response to the weakness of states, the inability of states and international governmental organizations in addressing issues like the climate crisis. But this has resulted in a, in a lively and at sometimes uh, very fierce debate um, on whether or not this is an eff effective coping mechanism or simply a form of depoliticization that pacifies environmental activism into something that doesn't really challenge the status quo anymore. Um, we need to keep in mind there that um, those kinds of alternatives and the more outspoken resistance are typically not opposed, that they often go hand in hand, uh, but that at the same time, uh, we still need to think about whether these local actions can really provide the kind of global answer that a global crisis like climate change uh, needs. So, um, moving on to the last bit of this presentation. I've so far talked mainly about how the state disappeared um, from climate activism, um, mainly as a result of disappointment in the ability um, of, of, of the state um, to, um, to respond to climate activists' demands. But I think we can say that some activists already for quite a long time have challenged whether this is a good idea. Um, one uh, climate activist in a meeting that I once was observing raised the issue when, when basically people were making this argument that we should ignore the state or ignore uh, international climate summits because the state was unable to do something about the climate problem. This activist raised um, his hand and, and explained um, that actually we shouldn't believe that, that the state might want us to think that it is unable to address this problem because that would hide its actual in unwillingness to, do, to really do something about the state. He raised the suggestion that really the state was unwilling to do something about the crisis and that if activism could change that, that, as a res that this might result in the state actually turning out to be able to do something about the problem. And of course, in recent discussions in the context of COVID-19, uh, we've seen climate activists basically repeat that argument. People, climate activists have been saying, Look at how forcefully the state is responding to the COVID-19 crisis. If only it would be willing to reply with such force to the climate crisis, um, then surely we would have already serve, uh, solved that problem. We can, of course, discuss whether that is the case or not. But it's just to introduce to you that this idea that we should stop focusing on the state because it is unable to address the, 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 the problems like climate, uh, climate change um, is actually something that is contestable and that is also contested. And again, I go back to this, these demands of, of extinction, rebellion. Uh, we demand that governments tell the truth about the ecological crisis. We demand zero emissions and drawdown by 2025, and we demand participatory democracy. Seems to be a clear break with this activism that I've been talking about so far. So from the end, from the late 2018, um, Extinction Rebellion proclaimed its uh, statement of rebellion in the end of, of October 2018. I think a few months before that, uh, Fridays for Future started when in, in August 2018, Greta Thunberg started her by now world famous um, school strike, which then escalated into a global um, campaign. And also Fridays for Future very much like Extinction Rebellion, also makes basically demands that the state do, does do something about, um, about the climate crisis with demands like listen to the science and politicians do your job. So we see quite a clear change here. We see basically a return of the state. 
So in this final part of the lecture, I would like to dig a bit into how we might be able to explain that. And I will do, be doing so on the basis of some uh, interview data that uh, I collected together uh, with a very large international uh, team of researchers. Um, we did structured interviews, so surveys, with a random selection of participants in three global climate strike um, days, gl climate school strike days, uh, organized by Fridays for Future. And in the end, we ended up with about 5,000 interviews um, with FF Fridays for Future activists from 25 cities across three continents. So we included um, um, Sydney in Australia, New York in the US and Mexico City. Um, and on top of that, we had 22 cities in different parts um, of Europe, East Europe, North Europe, South, West. Um, and we also basically, some colleagues of ours also collected data um, on Extinction Rebellion, uh, but that we only managed to do in, in the UK. Um, and so what I would like to look at is using these data, what role does the state play in these campaigns, really? And how can we explain that? First of all, to give you an idea, um, they, these graphs um, give you show um, based on the data that we collected in March um, 2019 in the cities that you see on the left. Um, the number of or the percentage of people who agreed or strongly agreed with the fact that with the statement that these demonstrations were um, focused on pressuring politicians. So those are the orange dots. And we see that in most demonstrations, um, especially among adults, but to a large extent also in the youth, almost everyone agreed that pressuring politicians to do something about climate change was the goal of the demonstration. So we see here, if, if we had, for instance, done this survey, which unfortunately we didn't, but if we had done this survey, at say um, a Friday's um, at a, an Ende Gelände mine occupation, we would have found that those orange dots would have been much to the left. Really, we would have found that many more um, would have indicated that pressuring politicians was not the goal of the demonstration. So it's quite historically um, unique. Also, if we look at the data from Extinction Rebellion. Uh, we find similar levels of agreement that the, that the demonstrations organized by Extinction Rebellion are really about the state. So it's not just part of the public, of the official framing of these demonstrations. It also comes out when we interview uh, individuals in these demonstrations. So how might we be able to explain that sudden shift in the role of the state in climate activism? Is it perhaps an answer to the shortcomings of the previous non-state oriented action forms. So going back to, for instance, these discussions that um, around the effectiveness uh, of uh, DIY politics, whether it basically just means the depoliticization of climate activism. Or alternatively, might it have something to do with the, the, the disconnect of the many newcomers in Fridays for Future and Extinction Rebellion, and the fact that because they have not been involved many of them have not been involved in climate politics before, that they basically aren't disenchanted yet. They haven't really been disappointed yet by the inability or the unwillingness of the state to do something about this crisis. Or finally, might it actually have something to do with the kind of motivation why these people are on the streets with um, a kind of more moralistic approach to climate activism, replacing a more instrumental one. So where previously climate activists might have thought in a way similar or like what might be the most effective way to do something about climate activism, we might now see that actually it is really about who has the moral duty to do something about climate change, regardless of how likely that actor is to actually take up that role. So I'll be talking about each of these um, possible explanations for the return of the state. On this slide, uh, what we see is some data indicating the average level um, of support among uh, school students and adults for the statement that stopping climate change must be primarily accomplished through voluntary lifestyle changes by individuals. 
we see that the answers to this are quite widespread. It, it looks very different from the answer to the question um, whether they agreed that the state should be, is the, that pressuring politicians is the main goal. Um, but to put this in a bit of perspective, we see that especially um, among sc school students, generally more than half of the respondents agreed or strongly agreed that indeed climate change must be primarily stopped through voluntary lifestyle changes by individuals. Um, and this was actually one of the solutions that we asked them about that they responded to most positively. So for instance, they, had, they indicated much less confidence in, the, in the, the state's ability to do something about climate change. So we, we see basically that um, the activists in Fridays for Future and to a similar extent the activists in Extinction Rebellion are not necessarily very skeptical about DIY uh, politics, about lifestyle politics. And actually about two thirds of the Fridays for Future activists indicated also that they themselves were involved in lifestyle politics. And among Extinction Rebellion, this was even 90%. I won't stay at this table too long, but this is basically to show you um, that in 2009, a similar climate demonstration uh, around the Copenhagen Climate Summit was, uh, was, was interviewed using the same method. And also there was a similar question about um, the role of, uh, of individual behavioral change in solving the climate crisis. Um, and we see here in the, in the top row, um, basically similar numbers, also uh, around 50% of the respondents think that individual behavioral change is a good answer to the climate crisis. So there is not so much that has changed over time. And so I think we cannot conclude that the return to the, sa the state represented by Fridays for Future and, and Extinction Rebellion campaigns should be really explained as um, a sudden um, break from the belief that lifestyle change is the answer to the climate crisis. I think we see mainly continuity. So let's move to the second hypothesis, if you wish, um, as to why we might see this return to the state among climate activists. We find um, in our interview data that um, newcomers, that, that the Fridays for Future and Extinction Rebellion uh, campaigns are to a very large extent made up of newcomers um, that, are that are largely detached from previous climate movements. So uh, therefore Fridays for Future and Extinction Rebellion might show similarities with earlier days of climate activism when also the new kinds of climate activists were only finding out for themselves just then that the state was not gonna solve the problem for them. So in other words, we might say that these newcomers are not yet disenchanted. So how do we find this in our data? First of all, our data do indicate that um, there are surprisingly many newcomers in the Fridays for Future um, movement. 38% of the people who we interviewed in March 2019 indicated that this was the first time in their lives that they attended a demonstration. Previous similar research on a broader set of demonstrations indicates that 10% is a typical number of first timers in a demonstration. We see furthermore that um, only 10% of the participants were a member of an environmental movement organization and only 8% were recruited by an environmental movement organization. Most were actually mobilized as you see in the figure on the right through online social media, through friends, through school, through work, so through informal mobilization channels. So what we have are really um, a lot of new people in climate activism, which is of course good news for the climate movement. Um, but we see a lot of activists who do not share that experience that previous activists have had. So can that explain why they, why they go back to this default option of making demands from the state? Might it be that these activists are simply not disenchanted yet? It's, this seems to be not the case. Um, these figures are not very beautiful and there is a lot going on, but basically what these figures um, indicate is the extent to which um, activists agreed 
with the statement that governments can be, can be relied on to solve our environmental problems. And all the red you see is people indicating that they think we cannot rely on governments to solve the environmental or uh, to solve our environmental problems. You see a lot of gray as well. Those people are a bit more ambivalent, but you see very, very little green. Very few people think that we can rely on governments to solve our environmental problems. So what does, it doesn't seem to be the case that because these people are newcomers into climate politics, that therefore they are naive in thinking that, climate, uh, that the climate problem will be solved by the state. So I think we need to look at um, a third possible explanation for the return of the state in climate activism. And that is the emergence of a more moralistic framing um, of climate activism. Let's look at this by now famous quote, quote or speech um, by Greta Thunberg, in which she said very forcefully, people are dying. All you can talk about is money and fairy tales of economic growth. How dare you? The, the, the moralistic messaging here is, of course, very strong. Similarly, we see here an elderly um, activist from Extinction Rebellion um, who has a sign around his neck that reads, I am a rebel so that I can look my grandchildren in the eye. So what we see here, basically, or my hypothesis is, is that these climate activists are less concerned compared to previous climate activists with what is really the most efficient way of doing something about the climate problem. Rather, they make a moral statement that the state and citizens have the moral duty to try and do everything they can to do something about climate change. For those people, the question whether the state is able or not to do that is less relevant because the state is simply morally obliged to do it. And the, and the aim of the activists is to try and hold the state to its moral obligation. So I think this, more, this moralistic turn can help us explain why we suddenly see a return of the state in climate activism. So I'd like to conclude by just posing some, some reflections on what that moralistic turn might furthermore do for climate activism. Um, we see that the, more, the, um, the moralistic instead of hopeful framing is quite a useful or a, quite a successful mobilizer in the climate movement uh, so far. We've seen higher numbers of people participate in climate politics than ever before in history. At least in the short run, it seems to be a very successful mobilizer. There seems to be, however, a paradoxical tension between um, agency and despair built into the core of the movement. On the one hand, this moralistic framing really gives people agency, brings them to the street as activists, but at the same time, it also deep recognizes at a very deep level that we are in trouble that we might not be able to solve. And so following this framing, I think that there are some dangers of the current movements repeating um, some of the mistakes that previous movements have made. First of all, I think that linking movement success to government to um, to the government's ability to do something about climate change might in the end again disappoint move, um, part activists and ultimately uh, demobilize them. The now or never framing that is very central to this kind of activism, we have to do now something about climate change or it will be too late, is very hard to sustain in the long run. We've actually seen that a very similar framing was used around the Copenhagen uh, mobilization in 2009. And that when basically it wasn't now, a lot of people thought it was going to be never and therefore they afterwards didn't bother again to be mobilized. Of course, there is something to be said that given the predictions of the IPCC, uh, given the very short, if any, window of opportunity to prevent dangerous climate change, it is of course a good idea to go all in now with climate activism. But can we allow climate activism to stop if we don't meet the deadlines that are currently prescribed by, for instance, the IPCC? 
or do we need to continue activism even if we miss certain deadlines for doing something about dangerous climate change? That's, for instance, the research that I'm doing into whether activists are engaging with uh, the question of climate adaptation, which, even though it is often presented to us as a strictly technical problem of how can we build sufficiently strong seawalls, for instance, is actually a deeply political problem that um, I won't go into too deeply right now. The moralistic framing that's very central to today's climate activism, furthermore, um, does in one, some way, not so much in addition to amplifying the scientific uh, imperative. It overlooks typically the trade-off uh, the trade-offs that are always there in climate politics and any form of politics between winners and losers. And so it thereby doesn't do so much to solve the political or the electoral difficulties that have so far um, contributed to, to stopping effective climate action. It also might play into the hands of depoliticization of climate politics, um, where science is most commonly seen um, as the solution to, uh, to climate activism, and where many in Fridays for Future, for instance, even argue that governments must act on what climate scientists say, even if the majority of the people are opposed. In Extinction Rebellion, we find this to be the case for even 88%. Um, and previous discussions of, on climate uh, politics and climate activism show that this kind of narrative doesn't really do so much to resolve the problem. Because the problem is not that we don't have the science to answer this problem. The problem is that we cannot overcome the political difficulties to do it. And amplifying the scientific imperative that we must now act according to the science perhaps doesn't do so much to overcoming that problem. So to wrap all of this up, um, we see looking at a short history of climate activism going back for about 20 years, that the state is initially the central figure for doing something about climate change, for demanding that something is done about climate change. And that over time, it disappears out of uh, disenchantment with the seeming inability of states and international governmental organizations to do something about it. But we also see it reappear um, every time and again. So it, while at some points in history, we see that disenchantment with the state leads to the, to the emergence of kind of DIY environmentalism through everyday lifestyle politics or direct action against, for instance, fossil fuel industries. Um, we see also that these kinds of approaches have some clear limitations, including depoliticization, um, as well as scale and coordination. Um, and we see that the new climate activism by Fridays for Future an extinction rebellion in response basically brings the state back in. I think one interesting question to take forward and a question that I personally don't have answers to yet is to see what basically these kinds of approaches to the state will mean for the role of the state in the Anthropocene. That we are in a period in history where a lot will be changing. Uh, so probably also the role of the state and we know from some theorists that the role of the state um, is co-created with civil society. The way in which civil society responds to the state and the way in which the state responds to civil society has a mutually constructive effect. So from that, we might deduce that the way in which um, climate movements respond to the state might have an effect on what the state will ultimately become. If the new climate activism stays and the climate activism is really about demanding from the state that it takes up its role as a provider of climate security, then that will amplify the role of the state as the, as the, the agent that ensures security within a territory. If we see, again, a return to the DIY politics, um, we might see a result as a result that the state ultimately becomes a less important actor in organizing society. But these are just some preliminary uh, speculations, of course. Finally, we need to keep in mind that the moralistic framing that is currently being used in Fridays for Future and Extinction uh, Rebellion is very successful in motivating activism in desperate times. 
but it has probably a limited shelf life and it has a somewhat dangerous depoliticizing tendency, which doesn't recognize the difficulties of climate politics that we need to understand to, un to know and to, to get a better grasp at why so far we haven't really solved this um, wicked problem. Um, so I thank you for your um, attention and I look forward to, to answering uh, your questions or comments. Good. Thank you very much, Joost, for this um, interesting and very thought-provoking uh, presentation. We would now um, like to move on to the discussion. As a reminder, we do invite all participants to submit their questions via the Zoom, uh, Zoom chat function. Uh, for security reasons, you will not be able to intervene personally, but you can um, type in uh, um, the, the questions that you have and your comments in the chat of Zoom, and then we will um, take that up and bring it into the discussion. Now, I would like to give the first word to my colleague, Brendan Colset, uh, to kick off the discussions uh, with some reflections and comments. So, Brendan, please uh, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sabine. Thank you, Joost, for a very interesting talk. Um, I'm I'm looking at the chat box and someone is asking to see the slide on the percentage of protesters who consider science as a solution. So maybe while I'm giving you some of my comments, you can um, put that slide on the screen again. Um, so thanks. I mean, it, 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 uh, it covers a lot of different things uh, and it triggered a lot of different thoughts uh, uh, with me while you were um, you were talking, so um, I'm just just I'm just going to throw it in there. I mean, I'm not sure it has a lot of structure, but uh, um, some random some random comments, I guess. Uh, well, there you have the slide. Great, thanks. Um, the first the first observation is um, is um, is a rather broader question about uh, uh, the, the, the premises of your of your uh, uh, the initial premises of the work. Are we? Is it that we're witnessing a return of the state, or is it that uh, newly emergent movements and uh, newly emerging movements are making a lot of noise, um, taking up a lot of space, which is which is great, but give the impression that. Um, the overall environmental movement is sort of shifting back to that. Um, if, if we go back to the history of the environmental movement, uh, at least in, 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 uh, in the West, uh, made somewhere in the 60s, it, it's always been a bit of a tension between these two sort of groups, right? It's always been there, right? Um, um, it was always part of the movement, uh, you know, uh, sort of back to the land type of approaches, uh, disconnecting from society. That's always very strongly been there in the environmental movement. Um, but we've seen also that, you know, with the emergence, especially with, with uh, big environmental NGOs, that pressure on the state was, was, uh, was increasingly important. Um, and it's always sort of, uh, sort of been there. So the first question would be, would be a broader one, like, um, uh, is, is, is it that we're really sort of shifting um, to the state again, or is it that just uh, that one side is becoming more, more visible again um, in the context of a much broader diversity of environmental movements uh, um, in, in, in general? Um, the second point I wanted to raise maybe is, 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 is a potential additional answer to, to, to your three, uh, uh, to your, your three IDs on, on why we're seeing a potential return of the state. Um, and, and, and it reminded me of something that, that James Scott wrote, I think back in, in 2014 or something, where he basically said, well, we're stuck with the state for now. Um, yes, we have to get rid of the state, 
but for an hour we're stuck with it. So we have to sort of confront it and we have to, we have to confront the institutions um, because for now there's, there's nothing really else that, that we can do. I'm simplifying the argument, obviously, um, but it comes down to, okay, we're, we're stuck with it. And it, it resonates a bit with what you hear sometime in the environmental movement, the, this argument on how to deal with capitalism. Uh, some people say, well, we'll just, we have to get rid of, of capitalism. And other people say, yes, we do, but we don't have time for this now. We have to solve uh, the environmental problem uh, within the next decade, basically. Uh, and we're not going to overthrow capitalism in the next 10 years. So, so we better start now with finding solutions and then uh, we'll work on, on, on uh, throwing out capitalism uh, at, a, at a later stage. Um, that's that's um, that's the second point. A third point that I that I wanted to make is, um, and that's probably a sort of uh, um, that probably has an analytical purpose. But this this, this distinction that you make between um, individual action on the one hand and sort of state oriented action on 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 the other sort of simplifies. Uh, it simplifies it to, to the point where the sort of individual action is, is uh, loses all form of credibility. And I think everyone sort of agrees that we're not going to save the, 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 the overarching problem by all sort of buying uh, organic toothpaste, right? Um, but there's other points to, there's other advantages to, to, to non-state action um, in the sense of, providing alternative political space, um, sort of helping to um, deconstruct the rationale of the state, to um, deconstruct the idea of the state as being the single um, political actor or even the single uh, responsible actor to address. Um, and, and overall sort of reducing the idea that um, social movements, uh, they're, they're reducing their reliance on, uh, um, on the state for building community and for effective decision-making. So um, I guess that's the sort of in-between stage um, that I think would add nuance to that sort of duality. Uh, but again, I'm guessing that this has mainly a sort of analytical purpose here, uh, but I would like to, to hear your thoughts on this sort of what that middle stage could, could add um, could add to it. And then, and then last point I wanted to make um, is the, um, is, is, is relating to your last point on, on the moral framing of, of climate change. And I think that's, that's really the, one of the key points here. Um, what is interesting with, with these new emerging movements beyond their sort of reliance on the state is also the wording they're using. Um, so, for the first time in, in just sort of broad public debates on the environment, we see the use of justice framing, which was mostly absent before that. I mean, it, it emerges um, around uh, the Paris Agreement, within, you know, a sort of civil society movements, within the more technical sort of discussions, but not in, not in, not in sort of public debates, right? And Friday for Futures especially is going to manage to make that visible, to make that intertwinement between social and environmental difference really visible uh, um, for a broader audience. So I think that relates very, very nicely with your sort of moral framing of, um, of, the, uh, of the question. And it also relates very nicely with some of the literature in the environmental justice literature and the role of the state there, um, especially um, as it relates to sort of um, environmental justice as considered by African-American movements, for example, and the role of the state in um, perpetuating uh, certain practices, certain practices of, of exclusion, of control, of violence, um, which part of the environmental justice movement is considering as, as the main problem and as the main reason why we sort of can't rely on the state to, um, to address a broader environmental justice problem. So um, you, you didn't really address much of that 
part of the of the talk, uh, despite it, it figuring in, in your in your in your title. So I wanted to hear you a bit more about possible links there uh, with the environmental justice literature and the sort of critique of the state that comes from uh, comes from that literature. Thank you very much. Okay, thank, thanks a lot for these um, thought provoking questions. Um, I think we have time to answer them all. Um, I also hope that um, I have all the ammunition to answer them all, but I'll do my best. Um, yeah, so the first question, is there really a return of the state or has it always been a bit blurry? Has it always been a bit of both? Um, yes, and I think that that's also why I try to emphasize that indeed we shouldn't think of this in any absolute terms of, of the, the state really being there and then disappearing and then coming back. It's more sort of a way to, to, do, to think about tendencies and, to, and perhaps I, I, I over, over articulate that. But to go into that a bit deeper, I absolutely agree that already from the beginning of the environmental movement, people were um, interested in, in it, like you say, the back to the land movement, building these kinds of uh, self-sustaining communities that were definitely uh, to some extent intended, maybe less as an, as an answer to ecological problems, but more as an escape from, from the oppressiveness of, of mainstream lifestyle. So that's perhaps a, a difference there, that it has emerged more as a sort of a legitimate tactic to try and do something um, about these problems. Um, but still, I think, unfortunately, it's very difficult to say, to, to quantify this in any way, because first of all, we don't have the historical quantitative data. Um, typically, this kind of research relies on protest event analysis to say something about trends over time. Um, using, for instance, a newspaper reporting on protesting. But unfortunately, be precisely because this kind of DIY activism takes place much more in everyday life, it's more difficult to say something about these processes over time. Still, we can say, I think, that, quant that survey data at least shows um, that more and more people indicate that they uh, participate in, in um, political consumerism, so buying or not buying specific products um, out of political or environmental motivations. Um, unfortunately, that only covers a very small part of, of what, we, what we might be talking about when we talk about DIY activism. But just to point out that there is some quantitative activism that uh, in measures to suggest that this activism is on the rise. We see something similar when we look at sales data of, of ecological um, or sustainable products. Um, so we do see that, that more and more individuals are taking, trying to take responsibility for uh, questions like, like sustainability in their everyday life. But again, it's not something new. Um, my claims are mainly based on um, having studied a, at least in two occasions, um, the most, uh, at least in, in Europe, the most visible climate mobilizations um, of its time. Um, in first instance, the mobilizations around the COP21 climate summit in Paris, um, where I observed that really the, the main discussion was um, should we target the, the climate negotiations or not, and where the main argument um, seemed to be no, we shouldn't. We shouldn't invest our energy in trying to make states do something because they will disappoint us once again. Um, and then the second what I think is the main climate mobilization after that, where it's so very clear that the state has become central again. In both cases, as I also indicate, using the, the survey data from Fridays for Future, for instance, we see that also these young people demanding action from the state are themselves involved in, in lifestyle politics, um, depending on which country we're talking about. But say, for instance, in Germany, there is a clear link between Fridays for Future and Ende Gelände. So we see these lines are very blurry and, and, and we shouldn't think about this in absolute terms. Um, but I do think, again, that really this questioning of, of the state as, as a valuable target of activism became very much challenged in, uh, in the aftermath of, of Copenhagen, basically, um, which was reflected in the emergence of, of some of the most emblematic direct action campaigns um, to date, and that we see now clearly 
the return of the state. So again, it's not about absolute terms, but I do think that, that at least I'm quite convinced that, that we can see these broad um, tendencies. Um, so are we stuck with the state? Is that the reason we see the return of the state? Well, first of all, that of course implies that we, that we see a return of the state and not simply just a continuous presence um, of the state. It seemed that um, at least for, for a few years, um, activists seemed to be quite, um, to agree with what was going on in much of the, the academic literature, which was basically saying the state is no longer or has become much less relevant. Um, in, in, in the 2000s, when people were writing about the importance of, of international governmental organizations, uh, the WTO, the World Bank, the UN, people seem to be generally in the mood to believe that the state was in the context of globalization quickly losing its relevance. And we saw that reflected in the emergence of transnational social movements as well, of course, and the climate movement, at least initially, um, can be seen as an example uh, of that. Um, the emergence also of these large direct action campaigns such as direct action against fossil fuels also seems to assume um, that the state should not be the central actor in, um, in climate politics or perhaps that it should be but that at, at, at the moment it isn't. Of course that might be incorrect and I think that interestingly in the recent in recent years um, and basically in parallel with the, 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 the changes that we see in uh, in the return of the state with Fridays for Future and Extinction Rebellion, we also see in academic discussions basically the return of the state and more and more scholars arguing that it is wrong to argue that the state is no longer um, as important as it once um, was. In particular in climate politics, of course, the, the Paris Agreement has made the state uh, the central actor of climate politics once more by basically introducing its, um, its in individual nationally, um, wait, I always forget what it stands for, but the, the voluntary commitment of the states in the INDCs um, to do at a national level what it takes to live up to, to the international standards um, of climate politics, um, which of course that might to some go some length, I'm, I'm sure that we, we would be able to find activists within Extinction Rebellion or Fridays for Future who will reference the Fridays, uh, the, um, the, the Paris Agreement to argue that that's one reason why the state has become um, important again. Um, so probably James Scott is right that we are for now stuck uh, with the state. And I think that a lot of climate activists realize that. I don't think, or I don't know whether they have this similar, this, this analysis that James Scott has about it. It would be interesting to, to, to explore that a bit more in, in interviews. Um, you raise the, the, the similarity with also with capitalism and the discussion of whether there is actually time to do something about capitalism. Um, I've recently written a handbook chapter about temporality in climate activism. And I think that this, is, this was one of the examples that I gave of the complex, complexity of temporality in climate activism again, because you see this debate. Um, on the one hand, you can argue that the time has run out for uh, small reforms and, and tinkering on the margins. Now it's time for radical change and you others argue there is no time for radical change. We have to keep uh, the incrementalism going. Um, some might take a, a middle position of radical in incrementalism, of course. Um, but um, yeah, I think this is also one of those typical unsettled but fundamental debates in, in climate activism. Um, I've, I've heard it mainly around capitalism, not so much around, uh, around the state. I think there is a lot more sympathy for overthrowing capitalism than overthrowing the state in, in, uh, in climate activism. I think most, capital, most climate activists still are still convinced that the state um, at least should be a um, legitimate actor, especially with Extinction Rebellion's claim for having a more participatory form of democracy is of course still very much embraces the idea uh, of the state, but it just needs wants, wants democracy to be organized in a different way. Um, is, and then your third question, 
is individual lifestyle activism and state-oriented activism really uh, that opposed? Um, I, I, I agree that it isn't in many cases. And I've, uh, in recent years, much of my research has been about trying to show how, how the two are actually related to each other. Uh, for one, many often um, lifestyle politics are, are in some ways actually state-oriented. People might, might get involved in promoting certain lifestyle changes um, with the idea that in doing so, they raise the general awareness about environmental issues and perhaps that will then have like electoral repercussions or that lifestyle politics is a good entry point into climate politics. It's very easy to do. And once people get involved, then maybe they get more seriously involved over time. It's also at a, at a more strategic level, I think many groups see synergies between lifestyle politics. Um, and state-oriented politics. Um, so why still then talk about it as if it is an opposition? Well, that's really a reflection of, of, of many of the debates that are going on both in scholarly literature about this, as well as between activists who do often see this as opposed uh, to each other. And I think it, on the one hand, we see those who are advocating individual lifestyle change or the kind of transition towns um, approaches often frame this kind of activism in opposition to more state-oriented activism. Um, for instance, actually the, the founder of this Transition Towns Network, I think, um, has, has said, I mean, already quite a few years ago, um, that the negativity of protest campaigning, the traditional kind of de making demands from the state, that that negativity is something that drives away activists and that therefore it needs to focus more on solutions and on, on sort of the energy that comes from being with your hands in the soil, etc. So those from that side of the debate, there is some um, juxtaposition of these two strategies. Um, but also on the other hand, as I presented, some, some activists really see this involvement in in lifestyle oriented politics as something um, that is that is really a big mistake and that's really buying into sort of this capitalist logic of us being consumers and not citizens and that we can consume our way out of this crisis. So some people, I actually really do see this as, as deeply um, opposed, but I think that if we look, that we can find many, many examples of both at an individual level and an organizational level that the two are, are not necessarily opposed at least. Um, and then finally, the moral framing um, and justice. Um, I would, I'm not sure I would agree that, that Fridays for Future really is the actor bringing justice in. Um, in some way it, it, it does, and, and especially Greta Thunberg has of course made quite explicit references um, to climate justice. Um, I think there are other other groups should be credited for bringing for for mainstreaming climate justice, even if perhaps Greta Thunberg's speeches bring it to another level of, of visibility. Um, but of course, the the roots of, of climate justice also in the environmental justice movement, also in in, in groups like uh, Friends of the Earth, who have historically played a big role in mainstreaming uh, the notion of, of climate justice. Um, so that has been happening for a while, actually to the point that it's become so mainstream that I think uh, Francois Hollande uh, quoted or mentioned climate justice when he opened COP21, which was, I mean, if we think about the fact that climate justice in 2009 still caused a split within the climate movement because half of the climate movement couldn't rally around that idea. Six years later, it had become so mainstream that even the, the, the French president basically framed COP21 as being about climate justice. Um, so I think much of that work has already been done. So that's on the one hand. And secondly, again, some Fridays for Future activists, of course, will support climate justice. Greta Thunberg does so quite explicitly in her speeches. And what, climate, what Fridays for Future does in particular is of course, stressing this idea of generational climate justice. It really makes it about generation, about the, the future generations experiencing the injustice as a result of the, of the actions of current generations. Um, that of course goes basically opposes a bit the, the idea that the, the, the traditional climate justice movements have fought for, namely thinking about climate justice as here and now, as recognizing that there is already communities who are suffering from climate change. 
and that there should be something done about that um, injustice. And I think Fridays for Future's emphasis on not making any political demands, on basically just saying, politicians, you have to do something about climate change, and being very explicit about saying, we are not going to tell you how you should do that. That's basically saying no to climate justice in a way, because saying yes to climate justice means making specific demands about how that should be achieved, because there is no universal standard for that. Um, so I'm not, I think I wouldn't agree with that. And finally, I think I would like to hear a bit which um, references you have in mind with environmental justice and literature on, on, on sort of and, and its role, uh, its views on the role of the state, because it's not something that I've looked into so much. Um, what comes to mind is that is basically also discussions about this kind of DIY activism um, that has been critical about that kind of activism from the point of view of, of also again climate activism, uh, from the point of view of, of climate justice. Um, because if we if we see a shift of environmental activism to this kind of DIY level, um, it basically makes sort of it privatizes environmental activism. It makes that um, we run the risk that specific, typically privileged groups benefit from this activism, whereas the traditional activism focused on making demands for environmental legislation would affect people regardless of their um, their privileged background. So I think that that is a, a way to 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 apply that kind of discussion to the return of the state and basically to say. Um, there is actually climate justice arguments to be made for the return of the state um, because it is precisely the kind of neoliberal retreat of the state saying we are not going to be able to, to do something about climate change and its impacts um, that is very much opposed from a social justice point of view saying the state, we should stop this neoliberal trend and, and the state should take its responsibility to prevent injustices. Uh, but of course, the environmental justice movement has historically had reasons to, to assume that the state wouldn't take up that role, but that's a different uh, discussion. Um, so I think that was quite a long answer, but... Uh, yeah, thanks a lot. I can I can share references with you uh, uh, later. I'm, I'm not going to sort of uh, occupy the spaces. I can see there's a lot of questions in the chat. Thanks a lot. Please do. Yeah. And maybe I can come in at this point. I also see that we have to work ourselves through the chat now, but I cannot um, resist to also bring up one point from my um, own perspective. Um, you framed and, and you partly um, commented on that um, also in the third question that uh, Brandon just, um, um, uh, asked and, and that you um, and gave your views on. So you frame the um, current development um, or, or the, the, the categories that you use is basically the juxtaposition between DIY versus state. So what is the route to go? And, and there is, and I understand you're making an empirical argument. This um, has changed from the perspective of the um, climate movement. And um, what I would like to point at is the um, kind of ambivalent character in my view of the DIY politics um, approach. Um, of course, much is possible on, a, on an individual level to make other um, consum uh, consumption choices, to, to, to travel differently, etc. So there is a, a lot to do. And um, what I find in that realm is um, that it is often frustrating in a way that even though I am or people are individually trying very hard to make more sustainable choices, it is kind of overwhelming because are embedded in structures that are um, essentially unsustainable in many respects, um, consumption systems, production systems, and, and the whole, the whole uh, uh, thing. And um, so from, from that angle, even though it is a good idea, I, I guess, to, to try out and to, to make personal changes and to do things differently, it is still the structural dimension that I cannot address on that level and, and um, also not groups of people, but there is some form of um, what well, let's call, call state response or collective uh, response um, 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 needed. But on the other hand, um, you can also argue that well, maybe politics and maybe state, the state alone cannot solve the issue because we still are um, have to face a, a very deep cultural change. And it's not just new, having new laws or more intelligent 
steering mechanism, so to say, but it's also this, this cultural change, which is maybe only be, um, where we can only make progress on that individual level or, or on that local level where um, practices need to change. So in my view, um, how also more from a strategic angle, how to bring about a more sustainable society that would always involve both. And, and there is not, for me, it's not an either or. And it's um, so, uh, and also not the question what is better or more suitable, but it's, it's so the, the um, amplitude of that, that challenge kind of suggests that both is needed. I don't know if you have any views on that. Yeah, that's a big question. And, and I, I'm, I'm not gonna be able to answer it because I think um, um, if I would be able to answer that question, uh, maybe I wouldn't be here or maybe, well, at least I would have some something more important than perhaps I have. But, but I, I agree that, that we need to think about these, about this in tandem and not as, as opposed to each other, especially for the reasons that you mentioned. Um, and I think that here it's perhaps useful to make a distinction between different forms of, of lifestyle politics. Um, the forms of lifestyle politics that are strictly focused on doing, on sort of trying to minimize your ecological footprint, to put it simply. Um, those might put some pressure on markets, or at least it creates some demands, but it doesn't go so far in, 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 in forcing broader societal change. But if we think about the kind of lifestyle politics that are perhaps more oriented towards demanding um, that um, that the state provide, makes it easier to live sustainably um, or more difficult to live unsustainably, uh, then we come, of course, much closer to, to bridging the, the gap between those two. Um, and that's also something that we do see in many forms um, of activism, many, many lifestyle organizations, so um, the ones that are more involved with, with enabling uh, sustainable lifestyles are, of course, um, very involved in lobbying uh, and sometimes protesting the state to, to get uh, the contextual uh, conditions that are necessary to make, to make uh, lifestyle change um, easier. Um, I don't know the details about that, but I imagine that the recent reintroduction of, of uh, night trains in, in Europe is a good example um, where People have been arguing, well, we, we might not, we want, might want to stop flying, but how am I going to get to, do, how am I going to do my traveling otherwise? And of course, there has been, I think, a lot of lobbying involved in, in trying to reintroduce these night trains as, 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 st as states becoming involved in the provision of uh, sustainable um, options. Um, so I would, I would like to think about the role, the link between the state being a, needing su support to, in, in, uh, to implement its sustainability measures um, and individuals needing the state to, to, to rely, to be able to make sustainable decisions more easily um, as, as related to each other. And I think it's a very productive space um, to think about. And it's of, it's of course not a new space to think about. It's historically a lot of the, um, uh, political and ethical consumerism has come about is precisely because of the people recognize this interaction and the need. Um, so think for instance about all those labeling schemes that we have today. Those also came out of campaigns that involved um, social movement organizations and individual lifestyle activists, as well as the states and, 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 and corporations who introduced those uh, labeling schemes. So. To think about individual lifestyle activism as completely individual is quite difficult. Of course, there is forms imaginable. If I were to say I'm going to try and found a um, self-sustaining farm, that might be quite detached. But in general, there is all these lines between uh, between that, and I think um, those those stress the, the the synergies and the interdependence between state action and lifestyle um, action. Um, I think some of the crit crit uh, uh, critiques could still be that focusing too much on individual responsibility taking still dis distracts us from 
uh, from the, the, the more structural change that that society um, would need. Um, perhaps some would go as far as to say that the state should basically ban unsustainable options from being available to us and then we we would solve that dilemma but of course then you rightly raised the issue that there wouldn't be so much public support um for that so i think the yeah the bridge between the two is a, is a productive space to to think about yeah yeah i agree and and what i found interesting now is to to reflect on what what, what, what does political mean exactly? It's at, at some point, the individual is kind of expanding into a political realm. And there is a lot of interesting dynamics going on, I find, in terms of politicization and depoliticization. And maybe it's a kind of going back and forth. I would like to pick up one of the questions we received via the chat. Um, you said in your presentation that we currently observe a, an evolution towards a moral, more, more, more moral framing of um, uh, the climate crisis and, and approaches to address that crisis. The question um, is that, that I, read, I have in front of me is whether this um, moral view is um, potentially diluting the impact of social movements, which is of course a, a collective um, form of action, whereas I understand from this comment, the moral stance would be more to make an individual, make it an individual um, um, view or, or stance to that somebody could take. What, what is your view on that moral, um, uh, moralization, politicization? Mm. Yeah, I think um, it's something that I try to, to cover in the, in the presentation, but, but perhaps didn't explain so well, but I think that there is a risk of depoliticization in, in moralization and as a result also diluting the, uh, the impact of the movement. Um, what moralization basically does is that it poses a certain position on, uh, on climate change or, or any other political issue as um, almost universal. It suggests that there is this one morally right position on the issue. Of course, I'm not contesting that doing something about climate change is more the morally right thing to do, but I don't think that that is necessarily the most productive political space because by now we find, except for um, some unfortunately very powerful um, people, most people agree that, that we should do something um, about climate change. That's not the reason, so, so the motivation to do something about climate change is not really the reason um, why so far too little has happened. So um, emphasizing the moral need to do something about that, I don't think is really going to get us so much closer to doing something about it. There is deep political reasons why we haven't done some, so much about climate. Um, that has much more to do with um, with winners and losers of, of certain climate politics, with recognizing that there is not one morally just way forward, but that whichever way forward you take, there will be winners and losers. Of course, if we don't do anything, there will be a lot of losers. And perhaps if we take one way, that, that can be shifted a bit more towards winners. But there will be, there will, it's very difficult to imagine that at some point we could have a scientifically informed morally universal approach to, to addressing climate change. Um, so basing your campaigning on that assumption, I think, is a bit out of touch with, with political reality and doesn't do so much towards trying to solve the, um, the political difficulties that are probably at the heart um, of, of, of why um, we haven't done so much. So, so to make that a bit more concrete, think, for instance, that about the yellow vests movement, um, which un a bit unfortunately, I think, has been often framed as an anti-environmental movement. I think that within the, 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 the Yellow Vest movement, there has been a lot of environmental sy sympathies, but what the Yellow Vest movement shows is that mainstream environmental policymaking has clear winners and losers, and that in this case, it was a to a large extent the people living in the countryside who were the losers of certain policies. Um, so basically not recognizing that is, 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 is blinding yourself to the political reality that, that, that in a, inevitably comes with any 
kind of political decision that needs to change society at the scale that we do need to change it. So I think it might be more productive, even though also, again, very problematic and difficult for these movements to think more about which, which kinds of trade-offs they are willing to make, which, which sacrifices they think um, society uh, should make um, and how that can be justified, not at a universal level, but more at a level of competing interests, which ultimately democracy, I think, is, is about, about organizing that in a civilized, quote unquote, way. Thanks, uh, Joost. I'm, I'm picking up with another question that was posted by a colleague of ours, Michael Holmes. Um, and and I, I, um, I thought of that too, when you were presenting that um, the return of the state in, in, in the context, in this context actually can mean the sort of return of international organizations, right? And therefore that the real solution is, is rather one in which, um, um, would be in the hands of, 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 the, of, of sort of supranational organizations. So it's the return of supranational organizations instead of the return of the state. Um, yeah, so I, I, in my presentation, I, I put those two kind of in the same corner as international organizations being, uh, being collections of states. And I think that it, um, that's a bit of a um, cutting corners, of course. Uh, those, depending on which which literature you are speaking from, those are two things opposed as much as night and day. Um, but from the point of view of climate activists, who might be one who are often wondering whether the state is really the, the right target, whether we can expect states to be uh, the actors addressing the climate problem, I think the two have have much in common, or or Basically, it is talking about individual states or or states collectively in in or, um, international organizations. Um, so I, I'm not 100% sure if I understand the, what the what the question really is. Um, but if I understand correctly, is it that um, the return of the state in the view of climate activists could also mean the return to um, international organizations. My, I'm, I'm not sure about that. What, um, but my my guess is that first of all, a lot of activists haven't really thought about it. Um, but that with the memory, um, or basically with the knowledge that the Paris Agreement is currently what we have, um, how difficult it was to achieve it, I think you will find few climate activists who would argue that um, it would be a good idea to, to really put emphasis again on, um, on trying to get a, a more rigorous um, international binding treaty then. Um, and so what we see a lot in the, in the framing of, of climate movements now is that even if they would probably agree that the Paris Agreement was too weak, um, they rally around it. Um, they use it as a way to legitimize their own action. They use it as a way to hold states to uh, accountable for their, their need to act. And given the, the, the INDC system within the Paris Agreement, I think they are mainly focused on, uh, on getting individual states to live up to making those individual commitments and then following through on that. I don't think that we see currently a lot, um, a lot of motivation to really go back to try and get from an international organization, probably the UNFCCC, uh, a more binding answer to, to the climate um, crisis. Of course, we've seen that even after the COP21 mobilization where a lot of activists I spoke to really didn't want to have anything to do with, with these kinds of climate summits anymore, um, that still a lot of climate activists still go back basically because it's an important media platform. Um, it's, a, it's a platform to show over and over again that states are not doing enough, which in turn may, can be used to legitimize the actions of, of, um, of climate movements. So in terms of, of public framing, I think those spaces um, have still remained important uh, in terms of really being strategic about how to find an answer to them. I don't see them becoming uh, much more important anytime soon. If, if it's of course a question when when we will have another one uh, given COVID-19. 
uh, that's another question. Sure, thank you, Joost. Um, I, I try to um, follow the uh, chat and the questions we receive from there. So there are two um, comments and questions in relation to um, um, well, state and participation, participatory governance. And uh, one of those uh, questions is asking about the uh, Janus phase of participat participatory governance in, in, in relation to that changing role of the state. Uh, so this uh, participant is writing, Fridays for Futures was repeatedly invited by the same heads of states and other high officials that are criticized by uh, Fridays for Futures. Future. So is, uh, um, is there a tendency of cooptation? Um, or what is the relation between the movement and the state? And um, in another comment, I read that in Germany, um, in the Fridays for Future uh, movement, uh, one activist, Jakob Blasen, has recently announced um, he's hoping to stand as a Green Party candidate in the 2021 federal elections. So, um, yeah, um, the, the question would be, what, how, how do you see that, the, the uh, relation um, between uh, movement and the state and uh, all pieces of participation, um, participatory governance? Um, good question. Um, I would, I'm not sure what the metaphor for it would be, but I guess a Janus phase suggests that it's two-sided, but I think that there is even many more uh, sides to it. And the, the relation between social movements and the state um, has always been a very, very contentious um, issue, both within the movements and I think also in the scholarship on social movements. And I don't think that I can come up with a, a simple answer. Um, the risk of co-optation is indeed um, a legitimate one. Um, there has also been a clear case, I think, of, um, of, of greenwashing uh, states and institutions through inviting these activists um, and of course, one can can wonder um, whether it's smart if if um, if these activists let themselves be invited to um, to these kinds of meetings, um, because on the one hand, of course, ultimately movements need to have get um, if if it is true, as as Brendan mentioned, that we will be stuck with the state for a while, then somehow the movement at some point needs to get inside either in, in itself or through political allies, of course. Um, but on the other hand, we see, of course, that that, that comes at a, at a cost um, and that so far a lot of politicians have been eager to, to proclaim a climate emergency, um, to really portray, um, to use almost the, the getting these, these young activists in their meetings almost to legitimize what they are doing to, to illustrate how serious they take the problem. Uh, but of course, since the beginning of these, these um, mobilizations, we still see, of course, an enormous gap between the, the more empty promises of, of declaring climate emergency and more specific policy making to actually um, address the problem. And this is, of course, not a new problem. Um, this is a problem that has been well researched in the literature on environmental movements. Um, where um, the environmental movement has, of course, uh, been one of the movements that has attracted most legitimacy in, at some point, becoming a very legitimate political actor. Um, but some famous studies have shown that um, once environmental movements start sitting at government tables, um, they, on the one hand, they don't win that much. They don't they rarely become centrally involved in core policy making, like economic policy making. They are more involved in sort of end of the pipeline, uh, small piece um, policy making, and they pay a large price. They they often um, become more institutionalized. They lose touch with their uh, with their participatory base. They um, they often have to tone down their radical messaging. So um, a lot of scholars. Therefore, would argue that social that the unique role that social movements have is precisely that as outsiders they are not limited in 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 what they say. Once they are inside the political decision making process, they have to act according to the either written or unwritten rules of the political policy making, and they lose a lot of their critical edge. 
And so I would also be inclined to say that movements uh, need to be very wary of, of losing that. Of course, Fridays for Future still is, is a clear political outsider that, that's still able to formulate that critical message. And that's very um, important. Um, but again, I also agree that, that it needs to think about how it can get into um, political decision making, um, either itself or through political allies like, like Green parties. But I, unfortunately, I don't have a recipe for how, uh, how they can strike um, that balance, but it's a very, that's a very difficult, um, difficult one. Um, I recently saw a presentation um, on um, uh, the Spanish um, Indignados movement, which has been quite successful in, in getting into Spanish government positions, in particular through the party of Podemos, um, but also through more uh, local level parties have had a lot of political access and have also been celebrated for having been influential there. But uh, the bottom line of that, of that analysis was really that ultimately they remain stuck within the, the structure and, and, and uh, are very limited to make more fundamental changes. So I think that's a, a clear risk for any climate movement trying to get into political institutions as well. Yeah, this um, it might be a good moment to bring in another comment. We should a participant um, from Turkey, obviously. Um, he or she writes that uh, she's now um, in part of the Extinction Rebellion uh, movement in Turkey and is wondering um, why you limited your sample to European or Northern countries in terms of um, um, uh, um, pro uh, social movement analysis because um, uh, that participants thinks that Global South countries protesters may interpret differently this um, discourse we are discussing now, the return of the state and um, in, or, or options for um, political participation. And, and that might, of course, provide a, a different context for, um, for a movement um, like um, uh, Fridays for Future or Extinction Rebellion, etc. Would you agree with that? Yes, absolutely. And I probably should have introduced, started my, my presentation by making more clear the, the sort of the geographical focus of my analysis. Um, why haven't we included other countries? Well, the, the reason is quite simply, it has to do, um, in the case of the protest surveys, it has everything to do with the, the um, availability of uh, local research teams um, that happen to be within uh, our scholarly network. Um, you have to understand that basically um, when we started doing this, we didn't have any uh, resources for it. Um, so we, we started contacting colleagues within our network to ask if they were able to pull off this, this uh, protest survey um, in, their, uh, in their local cities. Um, unfortunately, and we drew a lot from um, a network that had previously done similar research but on different protest topics um, because we needed local teams to have the experience to implement this very rather complicated methodology to make sure that the, the sampling would yield a representative um, sample. Unfortunately, um, we tried to get more countries on board. Um, we were very close to getting South, uh, South Africa um, Chile and India on board, but ultimately, um, basically as a result of, of limited local resources, they weren't able to get together research teams um, to, to, to send protest survey teams out into the streets, um, which, which resulted in ultimately us having a rather northern um, focus, which is very unfortunate and it would have been really great if we could, could have had a more and more geographically diverse uh, picture. And I'm sure that especially this question of the role of the state um, would have looked quite different um, across different countries, not just the role of the state, but of course also quality of democracy. Um, thinking of the case of Turkey, of course, the role of the green movement there um, of activism in general is of course much more complicated in a, in a much more authoritarian regime. Um, so in those contexts, I think the question of is the state able to do something about this is perhaps quite um, irrelevant if your if your most immediate concern um, is really the safety of your your activists in such a suppressive um, 
regime. So I, I fully agree. Um, and, and I thank you for, for raising this. Um, I don't think we really have time and, and nor do I have the expertise to really go deeper into uh, the role of the state in environmental activism. Um, uh, but, but yeah, let's, let's just agree that, um, that it's important to say that this analysis is mainly about Western, uh, Western countries, yeah. Okay. Good. Um, I see that we do have only five minutes left and maybe this is um, a good moment to um, come to some concluding reflections. I don't know, Brendan, if you would like to come in on that. Um, um, Otherwise, my my uh, question would be to Joost, um what what is the what is the what, what where do you, where to take it from here? So, what do you expect in terms of the um, um, uh, future move, the future development of the movement? Um, so, empirically speaking, or um, what would you like wish for in in strategic terms? Um, what would be a good um, a way to go um, forward to be more effective, to be um, to have um, uh, greater successes. Um, do you have any any views on that, and would like to share them? Um, well, if I can do some some wishful thinking um, very briefly, um, then I then I think there is reasons to be. Um, pessimistic, but especially also optimistic about the situation we find ourselves in uh, right now. Um, the COVID-19 crisis um, shows is more than a health crisis, it's also a political and an economic crisis. And it seems to be a, a moment in which um, the kind of political change um, that two years ago seemed impossible now seems more possible than ever. Of course, we can also imagine that possibility to turn out very badly for us. Um, there seem to be a lot of, um, uh, to put it simply, fascist tendencies that are finding also political opportunities in the current situation. But I think that, that climate movements are presented with a fairly unique historical moment to, to try and get, um, maybe resolve their, a bit their crisis of imagination their ability to imagine that the radical societal changes that we that the climate crisis really uh, requires us um, to take um, that there the window of opportunity might be opening up and that and I hope that the climate movement is able to um, to yield that in certain ways. Um, of course, its most immediate problems are now trying to organize themselves in 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 a case in in, in many situations of. Of lockdown or semi-lockdown, which is still a, which is a big enough puzzle in its own. But I hope that they don't get don't don't miss this opportunity to uh, to try and um, yeah make use of this window of opportunity for more far-reaching change than than we've been able, allowed to uh, than we've allowed to imagine ourselves in recent years. Okay, let's take this as a final word. Thank you very much, uh, Justin Moore. That was um, a very rich presentation, uh, a very um, stimulating discussion. And um, of course, there are many more um, comments and, and thoughts we could have um, exchanged on that. But I think it was, in any case, very, um, a very rich um, a moment. And thank you for, for sharing this with us. And um, I also would like to thank uh, Brendan Colset for um, his comments and interventions, and I uh, thank Axel Gubele, who was the technical facilitator today. So um, yeah, let's leave it here. Um, good to see you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for a lively discussion. If anyone wants to email me, if, if questions were not answered, then uh, please feel free to do so. And I'm happy to, to pick this up further. So uh, okay. thanks for organizing. Bye, Good, thank bye you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, thanks.